the boys have all come home to play, and the million bands begin to play. We'll be dancing the victory polka, and when we lift the torch of liberty, any flag out land across the sea, when a man can proudly say I'm free, we'll be dancing the victory polka, and we will give a mighty Boys, see kids goodbye, and they'll come marching down to Avenue, the United Nations in When this lovely dream has all come true, we'll be dancing the victory polka. Dance, 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 victory polka. Join, join the merry throng. Hi, Jeff Thompson with Channel 8, and yet another edition of On the Waterfront. You know, living here in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, one is reminded every day by looking around at the various military installations and the debris really left over from World War II that this was a very active part of that conflagration. Well, there was a ship built. In fact, many, 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 many of these ships were built that probably contrib contributed more than anything else to the defeat of the Axis powers. These ships were the ships that won a war, really, and more than any other single factor provided ultimate victory to the Allies in World War II. Roosevelt called these ships ugly ducklings. The design was based on that of a British tramp steamer from the late 19th century, a design developed by the J.L. Thompson Yard in Sutherland. That's no relation, by the way. Though of an antiquated yet proven design, and though powered by reciprocating a, tri a triple expansion reciprocating steam engine, the old up and downers, these vessels were extremely innovative for their day. Why? Well, because they were built by the mile and cut off by the yard. They were built in assembly line fashion. And they were the first ships to be welded ships of near welded construction. That is, of course, rather than the riveting construction, which was used prior in shipbuilding of that time. They were the first ships to be sectionally prefabricated. The bow, the stern, the superstructure were all built individually and then joined together on the slipways, welded together like, like a prefab house. This made for very rapid, very, uh, very quick construction. The first, uh, the first ship built of this program was called the Patrick Henry. The Patrick Henry was started in early 1941, was completed just after Pearl Harbor. The Patrick Henry, of course, was uh, named for that great, uh, that great patriot who said, give me liberty or give me death. That ship was built in 244 days. Towards the end of 1945 in Richmond, California, the Permanente Yard, Kaiser Permanente, the same ship, same design, different name, of course, the name of this one was the Robert E. Perry, was built in four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes setting a world record that has yet to be beaten for shipbuilding. 2,580 of these vessels were built in 17 yards across the nation from Maine to Florida, Louisiana to Oregon. What vessels am I referring to? I'm referring to a fleet of ships built expressly for the emergency of war, a fleet of ships that if they would complete just one voyage, paid for themselves and ultimately saved the lives, saved thousands of allied lives. A fleet of ships that Rear Admiral Emery Land, who headed the program, dubbed the Liberty Fleet. Officially known by their maritime administration number of EC2, Echo Charlie 2, meaning Emergency Cargo 2, referring to the size classification, that's 400 to 450 feet. These vessels were, of course, the famous Liberty ships. They were named for patriotic Americans, again, like Patrick Henry, but there were some very interesting names given to him as well. Names like Joe Harris. Joe Harris was a famous sailor's outfitter from San Francisco. There was a Liberty ship called the Annie Oakley, the Joshua Slocum, the guy who sailed around the world, Ethan Allen, Carol Lombard, the actress. And there were even a few Alaskans, Sheldon Jackson and the Alexander Baranoff. 
They were built and manned by thousands and thousands of Americans during the war. Only one in 200 knew anything about shipbuilding at the outset. But by the end, more than half of the welders and shipfitters nationwide were women. This was the age of Rosie the Riveter. They came from all over the country, some never seen the ocean before. Yet they created a fleet of ships that sent war material around the globe and kept it safe for democracy. Under the vision and ability of the great industrialist Henry J. Kaiser, these uh, thousands of shipbuilders did their part to win the war by building hundreds and hundreds of these emergency temporary Liberty ships. 570 of these vessels became war losses. Some wrecked themselves. The early models had a disconcerting tendency to fracture their welds and split open at any given moment, as happened to a Liberty at Kodiak with troops aboard. Fortunately, nobody was injured. Those that did survive went on to flood the shipping lanes with cheap tonnage after the war. Many went to the Far East. Many went to the ubiquitous to the Mediterranean under the ubiquitous Greek flag. Many were laid up in reserve fleets to be eventually scrapped. And as the years have passed, these emergency vessels, these ships of a design that was above all expedient, ships that were given a lifespan of no more than five years, have slowly disappeared to time, disuse, and in some instances, spectacular destruction. There were two liberties in, during World War II, one at Texas City and one at uh, what's called Port Chicago in north of San Francisco on San Francisco Bay. Both of these ships were loading munitions. Both exploded, taking with them thousands and thousands of, uh, well, millions of dollars in property damage, hundreds and hundreds of lives, creating damage as far as 50 miles away from the site of the blast. Just tremendous, uh, tremendous accidents. The Navy itself took over a lot of these vessels and used them in various experiments. Some were put into atomic, bo atomic bomb test areas near Bikini Atoll with guys locked up inside to see what the results would be. Some were loaded with surplus explosives and then sunk to detonate the explosives and study underwater, uh, underwater seismic activity. In fact, there's a vessel right now that lies just 20 miles south of Rat Island in 2,800 feet of water that has 5,000 tons of high explosives still aboard. In 1967, the Navy sent the Robert Louis Stevenson, this particular Liberty ship, south of Amchitka to sink in 4,000 feet of water for what was then going to be the largest non-nuclear underwater explosion ever. Well, the vessel didn't sink. It rolled over on its side and drifted off into a fog bank. They found it a couple of weeks later, as I said, a few miles south of Red Island in 2,800 feet of water where it couldn't possibly explode. They tried to set off charges around the vessel to set off the big one, but uh, with that much explosive, and any, anything within five miles would have been shattered, including any submarine that tried to torpedo it. So it's still there. Hopefully the seawater has diffused the situation, and one of our trawlers doesn't accidentally catch the Robert Louis Stevenson. Meanwhile, we have a survivor here in Dutch Harbor. You're probably already aware by now that that's the Unisee which is right here, of course, in the Inner Harbor, working, working away as we speak. The Unice was built as the Liberty ship William J. Riddell and was launched from the J.A. Jones Construction Shipyard in Panama City in Florida in February of 1945. After two voyages to Europe, she was laid up in the James River until the Navy took her over and made her an electromagnetic experimental picket vessel. She was used to uh, conduct experiments in mine warfare. She then became a a uh, radar picket vessel. She had radar and communications equipment and stood on an ocean station and basically guarded the shores of America as a radar ship. In 1958, she was modified to uh, include some more radar equipment and again was used in that capacity. The Navy changed her name in 1959 to the USS Tracer from her Navy name, which was that of the USS Interrupter, something a little less uh, provocative, I suppose. Anyway, uh, she was used up until the late 60s until she was laid up again in the Navy Yard there at Bremerton. And at that point, uh, Universal Seafoods got a hold of her in 1974, where she had already been partially converted to a freezer processor and brought her here to Dutch Harbor in 1975. And here she is today, uh, still processing since 1975. And of course, this vessel is now well over 40 years old and was only built to make one voyage, and that of an emergency situation during World War II.
The UNIC is now in a position that was formerly occupied by the VITA. I'm sure most of you remember the VITA. She laid there for quite some time, was also a, a fish processor, was deactivated quite some time ago. The VITA was built as a Thomas Bullfinch, and last year she was towed out of here to Taiwan or the Far East for scrapping, and on her way, uh, unfortunately, foundered and sank off of Taiwan. Probably a more honorable end for her. Um, anyway, we have the, the UNIC. I'd like to point out some of the characteristic features of the Liberty ship. Um, if you look along the deck line, that is where the gray meets the white, basically, you see that it's one continuous line. That's what's called a flush deck. It doesn't have the forecastle head or the, the raised uh, forward part like a lot of ships where they, they build up the bow. It's a flush. It's a, one continuous line. You can see that UNICE, of course, has built a lot of processing equipment and moda has modified uh, the deck space of the Liberty to a large degree. However, much of the original uh, design remains. You see that the king posts forward and the, that one mast that has the, the round with the lights on it, that was the radar. That was for the radar. That wasn't the original rig of the Liberty ship. This, uh, this particular Liberty was built as a boxed aircraft carrier type where they would take boxed aircraft in four hatches. The, uh, the uh, typical Liberty had five hatches. The, the third hatch was a small hatch just forward of the house. Now, the house is the part it says Unice, and then forward of that, of course, there's another structure that uh, has been built on. That number five hatch would be right in front, where, right where that mast is on the very front of the house. The stack is still uh, the traditional hooded stack that was used on the Liberties, and uh, the house remains virtually the same. Um, mo most, most of the ventilators, of course, have been removed. Most of the uh, original uh, rigging and gear, cargo gear, has been removed. But overall, uh, from a distance, she retains that uh, very distinctive, very, uh, very known profile of a Liberty ship. Looking past the Ocean Fury aft, there are deck houses that, again, were used, were built by the Navy for their, for the radar duty. You can just, if you look past the white mass of the Ocean Fury, you'll see a, uh, a platform there that was again used for radar for this ship when it was on uh, ocean radar duty. Uh, if you look at the very end of the stern, you can see a little bit of a, a bow, a little piece of metal that sticks out. That's part of a gun tub. The Liberties did have, were armed. Uh, they generally carried a crew of, of 45 uh, civilians, and they would have a Navy gun crew uh, led by an ensign of maybe 10 to 15 for a total complement of between 60 and 70 on board. Everyone was housed in the house. Uh, this was the first ship to not have the true forecastle where the seamen would go up forward. Everybody lived in the house. This was for safety considerations. Based on the fact, of course, that the vessel was bombed, everybody was together. A lot of these ships were bombed. Some suffered incredible damage, and yet were able to still make port. The Liberty ship had, again, a triple expansion steam engine of approximately 2,000 horsepower. She had a service speed of 10, 11 knots. They were not known as uh, as being particularly fast. They were a good sea boat. They handled pretty well and uh, did well in convoy, where most of them, of course, would go to the Murmansk or the Russian run or, or either the east or west coast. We had, of course, a lot of these vessels were lend lease. A lot of them, in fact, the Alexander Baranov was given to the Russians and was renamed the Valery Chekhov. So uh, from one Russian to another, I guess. And uh, again, they uh, they served their purpose. And they really they served it well. And it's just it's amazing that we still have uh, have some of them around to see that to see what they were and and uh, understand a little bit of that history. The last remaining Liberty ship in original configuration is the Jeremiah O'Brien, and it's in San Francisco Bay. It steams around. Oh, every what they call Maritime Day. It's some day in May. They fire it up. These old guys that were on the ship come down and you get down there about a week beforehand and drink a lot of coffee and fire up the boilers and take it for a spin. It's kind of exciting. And if you're ever down there, I recommend stopping by and seeing the Jeremiah O'Brien, and you'll see immediately how similar it is to the Unice that we have here in Dutch Harbor. Well, thanks for watching. This has been Jeff Thompson with Channel 8 on the waterfront. And a million bands begin to play We'll be dancing the victory polka And they'll come marching down to Malibu The United Nations When this lovely dream has all come true We'll be dancing the victory polka